Good morning, church. It's wonderful to see you. And it's wonderful to be seen by you. And it's a good day that the Lord has made for us to learn from him, learning from his word. What a privilege we have as his people to continually do that as we gather together in his name. So thank you for those joining us for the first time. This is Calvary Chapel and we love people, we love you. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. We are in Acts chapter 10 as we go through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, until when the Lord will return. We did 23 verses last week. We are going to pick it up from verses 23 to the end of the chapter today. And before we do that, let us pray. God, we thank you again. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that we are gathered together in reverence of your name and your word. We ask, oh God, we know that there is power in your name, even right now, even today, to deliver us from ourselves, to deliver us from the chains and bondages of sin. And as your word comes forth this morning, I pray that your, your Holy Spirit will be at work in us this morning, we pray. Amen. Open with me your Bibles. Acts chapter 10. Let's begin from verses 23. This was after this man who was sent with Cornelius, we studied last week, uh, had come to Peter and Peter showed kindness to them, not because of what he would want to do, but because the Holy Spirit had already prepared a way for them. He knows as a Jewish person, they do not mix with the Gentiles. They don't come close, no contact, no fellowship. In fact, they say even their shadows would not mix, the Jewish people and the Gentiles. That is how the hatred was so great in them. Then he invited them, the three guys, and lodged them. And the next day, Peter went away with them. And some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. These were guys that were around Simon the Tanner's house. And there were six people, as we are given account in chapter 11, verses 12. He said, Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. So there were six guys who accompanied him, and the three other guys who came with him. They went and uh, found Cornelius in his home. And the following day, he, when they entered, Caesarea, now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Now this morning what we are going to talk about is the gospel that overcomes barriers. As we saw also last week that there was already a barrier, though we know for sure that Peter is born again, and the rest of the Jewish people, that, you know, the, the, the thousands upon thousands who got born again, they're really born again, but there's still a looming trouble with these people that they don't want to accept the Gentiles. 
or if they are to be born again, there has to be another process for them to be accepted in the fold. If they are to be accepted, number one, they have to change from being Gentile first to uh, be, follow the Jewish culture. And that means they would uh, be circumcised first and consider the dietary laws and all these other many things for them to be accepted. And then after that, they can become Christians. So we see there's, there's a barrier already. And the reason why uh, Peter accepted to bring these three men to lodge with him is because God told him when he was seeing things and the Holy Spirit told him, hey, there are three men down there looking for you. Go meet them. If it was not of the Holy Spirit, that would have been a hard thing, a hard nut to crack. And now we see that they went to Cornelius, and Cornelius was waiting for them. You know, the fact that uh, Peter accepted to be with these Gentiles is an indication for us that the walls are being broken bit by bit. He brought the six men with him to the house of Cornelius, and these were Jewish Man, it is still trouble. We shall see it. They are happy that they are going to do something for the kingdom, but still they are worried about the culture. They are worried about their background, where they come from, the things that they do and how they don't mix together with these people. But Cornelius, being a diligent man, you know what he did? He prepared his close friends and his relatives. He shared with them what happened. He was fasting. He was praying to God. A man appeared to him with bright countenance, and this man spoke to him. And he knew for sure that there is a very important message that they're going to receive. He didn't know what it was exactly, but he just knew there was something important. And so he prepared people way ahead of time before the apostle would arrive. Very interesting. And for these people that he gathered together, the relatives and close friends, maybe there are people who just gathered together because he was a man under authority and in authority. He had the ability to command them to gather together. They would, because he is a man in authority and under authority. I don't know if all of them gathered because they wanted to or because they were just honoring the authority of this man. But regardless, they gathered together. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up! I myself am also a man. I also am a man like you do. I have seen it time after time that, you know, for for the so-called, the man, the man of God, People will come to them. People will bow before them. People will do a lot of things and they never say no. They never reject it. Why? Because they love it. People love to be worshipped. People love a lot of power. People love people who come and bow before them and do all sorts of things and they enjoy this kind of authority. Bow before me and I will do whatever. And they're like, you know, in fact, the people will bow before them and they'll just pat them on the back. In other words, they're saying, continue doing what you do. I like it. But see what Peter is doing. Say, hey, I am just a man like you. I don't know what your background is. I don't know what you had. I don't know 
I don't know. I just don't know things about you. But one thing I know for sure. You are a human being. And I am. And none of us deserve worship. Only God deserves worship. So friends, look around your circles. Have you at any point worshipped anyone for any reason? Just because they are messengers and they are sent? Just because they have the authority? Just because they are the presidents of these countries and these nations? You want to bow before men? He told him no. See, Cornelius was waiting to receive a messenger. And this messenger was Peter. Before he arrived, he already prepared friends and relatives for what is to come. He did know the content of the message. All he knew that there was a man who was coming down to preach to them. And then Peter arrives and Cornelius fell down before him and Peter rejected that worship because worship only belongs to God. And we will try to understand Cornelius. Cornelius' reaction was maybe understandable considering who he was and his back background, but it wasn't right. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your background. We are told in the Bible it's that only God is to be worshipped. One true God. Yahweh. Only Him. So in other words, you know, he thought maybe this is another messenger like the one who came and spoke to me. So I'm supposed to be reverent to them. Maybe his intentions were right. But the actions were not just right. You don't do that to any human being. And as they talked with him, as they talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Many who had come together. He went in. Now, friends, this seems very normal for us. This seems like, you know, it's, it's a kind gesture. When people come, you invite them to your house or whatever, your office. They come in and you have your conversation, you have your meal, you have whatever. But I want you to consider the background of these people. This is a Gentile, this is a Jew. These people never do things together. He went in his house. This seems to be normal occurrence, but for a Jew to enter a Gentile's house, that was quite a stretch. There was no keeping company with people they regarded as dogs. They never had the Jewish people, never help a Gentile, for that matter, a Gentile woman who is pregnant. For they say they're going to help another Gentile to come into the world. No helping people. We stick to what we do. We stick to our culture. We stick to our traditions. No helping. But he went in. And these six guys who came with him, they are watching and they're beginning to be troubled. What is happening? Is, is the apostle losing something? Is watering things down? There are many people who are gathered in this house. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful is it for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one another's nation. You don't keep company with another person who is not a Jew. You don't go through their nation. 
But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You know, by this we surely know that what he saw in a vision was not about physical food, but about people. No man should be called unclean in regard to our state. A Jewish man, a Gentile, we all need a savior. Regardless of our backgrounds, we all need God. We all have sin and in need of a savior. So God told him, don't call any man unclean or common. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent. I asked them, what, for what reason have you sent for me? Peter is asking a very brilliant question. A very remarkable question. For what reason have you sent for me? Why am I here? Why did you call? Why did you take the trouble to bring me in here? What is the intention of this? I know that God is involved because he spoke to me to meet these guys. And they said that you did send them that I should come. Why am I here? So Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And said, Cornelius, your prayer has been hard and your arms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon, Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon Etana by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. When he comes, he will speak to you. He's already come. He's asking what to speak. So think about it. By this, we, sh- we, we are seeing for sure that these men are honoring God. Both Cornelius and Peter. For Cornelius was to believe in this voice of God And to honor God in bringing Peter to him. And for Peter was to hear God and to go and meet Cornelius right where he was. And as as Peter came, he was already prepared with the message. How do we know that? That when the Holy Spirit came upon them, the Bible told us. Jesus told them. You will receive the power to be my witnesses. You, from then forward, you will be my witness. In and out of season, that is what you're going to do. And we have witnessed that through all these lessons we have learning. We see them preaching the gospel every time. They go to a crowd of people, they preach the gospel. They are called before the religious leaders, they will preach the gospel. And if you've been keen, you will see that they will present the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the central message of salvation. And he's saying, for what reason have you sent me? And then this man notably said, I was praying and fasting. Now think about it. Cornelius was praying and fasting 
and he wasn't a believer of Jesus Christ. How is that possible? And he's told that your prayers, your giving of alms, have come before the throne of God as a remembrance. God remembers what you have done. Friends, God knows the hearts of those who seek after him. God knows their hearts. He knows those who are diligently trying to find the Savior. He's the judge of them all. He's the judge of all of us. This man was just fulfilling his religious duties, and God comes and visits him. And God, in his providence, didn't just want this man to continue, you know, doing his religious things and thinking that that would earn his way to heaven. That for sure will not. It doesn't matter what you do. If you have no Christ in you, those things, you have received your reward here on earth, and we are done. But he said, I was fasting and praying in my house, and behold, a man stood. These words, when they're written, they, I don't know if we would try to figure out the emotions that would come with it. You're just having your good time. You're fasting. You're probably your... You know, four days, you're already weak in your body. Not a lot of strength. And then someone appears in your house with bright countenance. You can die. <laughs> that will scare you. You know, for those who, people, people say, well, God, I want to see you. I'm going to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you. How do you want to see God? Because the Bible tells us no one sees him and leaves. But we know from the Bible that Adam, Adam walked with God, not physically. He walked with the voice of God and he was content. Always content. When he sinned, he said, I'm hiding. God told him, who? What is happening? You, can you hide from my presence? Is it possible? In other words, God was just asking him, what have you done? What have you done? Your prayer has been heard. And then he sent. He said, when he comes, that is Peter, he will speak to you. When he comes, he will speak to you. So how do you figure out that answer from a man who is expecting you to speak to them, yet you were not told what to go tell them specifically? But all we know is that Peter came and he was always prepared with the gospel, with the message of the cross. And also, we find an interesting group here that the listeners also, not just Cornelius, but a bunch of people were ready to receive the message. We can evidently see a seeking savior finding a seeking sinners ready to hear from him. This might have been a very beautiful scene to behold. Think about it. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it as, you know, a person who shares God's word every other week. To find an audience 
who are ready to receive God's word. This, this, this will bless your heart. This will be so encouraging that people are excited. They want to receive God's word. They, they, they are hungry for the word. They want to know. They're ready. And this by implication means that everyone needs to do their part. The preacher to come prepared and the audience to have the anticipation of God's word. You coming prepared or you're coming for hangouts? You're coming because what? What is your reason for attending a fellowship? Do you want to meet God? Or there's something you want God to do for you that is why you want to meet him? What is it? Every preacher will tell you they would like it to find people who are ready to receive. Because sometimes it gets people wonder, it gets us wondering. You know, the, God's word is preached every week. Yet people's lives remain the same. There's a disconnect somewhere. If God's word is so powerful that you know, the, the apostles would go and teach in a particular place and God will be received and people will be healed and the broken hearts will be healed and miracles are continuing to happen. The question is, do we pay attention to God's word? Because God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It never changes. If God saved people through the Red Sea, he can save people through his word right now, today. And he can save people tomorrow when we see it. How be it that we have hardened our hearts? So, Cornelius continues to say, so I sent, I sent you immediately, and you have done well. <laughs> you have done well. Now, therefore, listen to these words. We are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. These are very interesting words. We are before God. Listen, this is Cornelius' house. <laughs> this is where he lives. He's invited people. Maybe they've prepared food and the environment is ready for this wonderful meeting, a revival meeting. He's saying we are be before the presence of God. This is my house, but we are before the presence of God. He immediately turned his house to be the gathering of God's people, even before receiving this word. And he said, you know, think about it. You're Peter the apostle and you're hearing these words that we are present before God. Like, who is this guy? We are present before God. You are a Gentile. You're present before who? What confidence do you have to say that you are present before God? If you are to be present before God, we got to circumcise you people first. We got to do something first before we bring you in. I love this guy. We are all present before God. To hear all the things commanded you by God. In other words, whatever you're going to speak, make sure it is from God. <laughs> not of yourself. Not your own ideas about salvation because his own ideas is it is the Jewish people who are going to be born again. 
Nobody else. Scrap your ideas and tell us what God has for us. Don't have your pet salmon and you're using God's word to project it to people. That I, I like it when I preach this. There's always engagement with the audience and all that kind of stuff. No, get it out of your mind. Leave it out there and preach the word. You can see that even the Holy Spirit is prompting Peter through this man that he should not speak any other thing apart from God's word. Then here begins Peter's proclamation of the gospel. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. As things are unfolding, how is it that a Jewish man would confidently tell me that we are before the presence of God and that God wants to speak to them through me? God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. First of all, Peter is not giving credit and saying, well, everyone who does righteous work, regardless of who they are, they're going to go to heaven. God knows the intentions of everyone. When you're helping people, when you're serving, when you're seeking for a savior, he knows. In fact, the one prayer that God will answer, maybe right to immediately, is a sinner who wants to change. A sinner turning from his wayward life and coming to him. You say, Lord, here I am before you. I'm a sinner. I need you. You receive forgiveness and salvation immediately. Immediately. God shows no partiality. The word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. The word you know, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day. And showed him openly, not only, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before God. Even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophet witnessed that. Through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. What a powerful gospel is preached here again. We are reminded here by the apostle that there cannot, there can be no faith apart from the word of God. Paul writes in Romans 10 verses 17, 
So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as the word of God is being preached, their faith is being ignited. They're receiving God's word and God is walking in their hearts. Peter made it clear that when it comes to sin, there's no difference whether you're a Jew, you are a Gentile. We all need a savior. Romans 2, 11, for there is no partiality with God when it comes to the matters of sin. All men have the same creator and all men need the same savior. We all men by God. Same God. And all men need the same savior. Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if you've heard of another Savior, that's upon you. We only have one Jesus Christ. It is not Buddha. It is not Muhammad. It is not all these other people. None of them will take you to heaven. So you better straighten up things this early. Let it settle with you that Christ Jesus is the only way. He's the only truth. And people will say, well, but you know, even our Muslim brothers, our Hindu brothers, oh, no, if they're not born again, they're not born again. Please. There's no in between. Their good works will not take them to heaven. I promise you. It is only by believing in the name of Jesus that people can be forgiven. People say, oh, but we believe that Jesus was a good prophet. He did good things. No, 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 no. He was not just a good prophet who did good things. He's God. And through all the scriptures, it has always been clear and he said to them here that to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. Only in this name, the name of Jesus Christ. And we see that this was the message that Cornelius was supposed to hear. Him and his family and his close friends. The message of the cross. In preaching, Peter made sure that the death and the resurrection of Christ is clearly understood. And then he announced to them the good news. Say, whosoever believes in him shall receive the remission of sin. Friends, that is the only way. Or there's, there's no better way to bring it out. If you don't believe in the name of Jesus, in fact, those who do not believe in the name of Jesus, the Bible said that they are already condemned. Just by the fact of them not believing in the name of Jesus. And this is not just the mere saying, well, well, I believe he exists. Well, I believe Jesus exists. And so and so exists, and so and so exists. Whatever God you want to worship, have fun with it. It doesn't work like that. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you know you are a called person from the world. That is not the world, what the world preaches to us. The world tried to preach inclusivity, that we are all, uh, you know, that these religions are just, denominations are just things that people do here and there, but we are serving the same God. No, no, no. If it's not the God of the Bible, then we don't serve the same God. In fact, if your God will make you manipulate people to get things from them, it is not the same God. Because our God doesn't do that. 
You're worshiping other gods, worshiping idols. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Every time Peter preaches, do you hear things about himself? It is about Christ all the way. About Christ all the way. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the point for the whosoevers. If you believe that, then you can be saved. If you believe that, you are amongst the whosoevers. If you don't, you're already condemned because you don't believe. Very powerful. The prophets of old prophesied and they spoke and they said there is salvation through just one man, Jesus Christ. And while Peter was still speaking, speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, now these are the Jewish people, those who accompanied Peter, who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. As I told you when we began, these people, they are born again. The, God is working in their lives and many things, many great things are happening. But still there's a problem. They still have these traditions that they don't want to let go. If you want to know for sure that we are holding on to this tradition, get yourself into our home gatherings and koitos and the dowry negotiations and all these things. You will know where we place Christianity and where we place tradition. You will know. <laughs> for the vast majority, it is tradition for us then Christianity comes but die. But, 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 but I'm a kikuyu, I can't change that. But I'm a luo, I can't change that. I'm a kamba, I can't change that. There are only two ways. Either God's way or man's way. Two traditions. It's either it's God's traditions or man's traditions. You choose which one you want to follow. If you have placed your tradition above God's word, we know for sure that there are things you need to be delivered from. You need Jesus Christ. You're like Cornelius, who is doing a lot of good things, but has no Jesus. These people, they are wondering, like, how, how is it possible that God would pour his spirit upon, harshly they used to call them dogs. How does God do that? Is this something that is so strange to us or we don't just understand it? And we can easily you know, stratify people, clustering people. This group of people, they can get born again. If you see them, you know, just, you can talk to them. You can do this, but you can't. You know, it was a problem some years back with the, 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 the Dutch reformed, the, the Boers who came from the Dutch and they went to South Africa and then when they were coming this way towards the plateaus and they were being employed by the uh, 
British lords to be farm managers. These Boers believed that Africans cannot be born again because they don't have a soul. And it was a problem. You don't have a soul. Where's your coca? <laughs> you can't perceive. The Holy Spirit cannot come upon you. And even without saying a lot of things, maybe other people are still thinking the same way. They just don't voice it. And these people cannot be born again. Do you know who they are? These people, they love money. These people, they love food. These people, they love education. These people, they love tradition. These people, they love their kettle. These people, they, we, we have all these things, we'll say. They can be born again. I mean, who are you? Are you Jesus 2023? We're serving people. <laughs> no, no, no. Your blood cannot even save a cockroach. <laughs> it can save nothing. It cannot even save you. Even in ourselves, there's no right thing apart from that which is imputed by God. Why are they wandering? Because they're Jews. And the Holy Spirit or God only comes to the Jewish people. Why? Because the Jewish people are the chosen ones, right? The chosen ones. They wandered. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They spoke in tongues and magnified God. How did they know that they magnified God if this tongue was not understood? Because every, every time we hear about tongues, we go crazy. Like, oh, there was That is not what the Bible is talking about. Not even close. Because this is a language that is well understood. As it appeared in Acts when the Holy Spirit came upon them and the people around were wondering, are these people drunk? They are speaking in our own language, praising God for the wonderful things God has done. And here these people, you know what they're doing? They're magnifying God for the wondrous things he's done to them. The works of redemption. How God, the creator of the universe, would stoop too low, come to them, and the people who are left over there. Now, this grace has appeared to them. For sure, if you know that that is you, you will praise God. If you know where God took you from, you will spend a lot of time thanking him for what he's done for you. That God, they left me for dead. They left me for the enemy to devour me. The family, the friends, everyone disappeared. I'm left alone. Yet, I am not alone anymore. You will sing praises to God. They're praising God. Maybe even God caused them to speak in the, uh, the Jewish language, the superior language, the language of the chosen ones. And they're wondering, what is happening? How is this possible? How is it possible? And it is by God's design that God brought these six men so that when they will go back to Joppa, their hometown, they will also begin to change their mind on how to accept people. You're not just finding your own people in the street to preach to them, right? This one is dressed like a Maasai. I'm a Maasai. 
here we go. <laughs> that is not how it works. You go preach the gospel to everybody. Everyone. That was the message of the cross. And as opposed to other groups, these ones received the Holy Spirit in the middle of Peter's sermon. Other groups, they will receive the gospel and then they will go and baptize them and then they will call Peter to come and pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. They just received the Holy Spirit in the middle of preaching. This tells us that God does not follow a specific sequence to accomplish his will. That this is how he's going to do it. This is how he's going to do it. No, 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 no. God never allows us to try to figure out how he's going to do things. Whatever is revealed to us belongs to us. Whatever is not belongs to God. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The word that is revealed to us, this word should cause us to have a change of mind. As I bring the worship team to come. The audience, before Peter arrived, they were ready to receive the word. And as Peter preached, everyone who heard the word the Bible says, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And they began to praise God. What a wonderful scene also to behold. That when the Holy Spirit is at work, when God is working in people's hearts, people will begin to praise him. People will begin to say things that bring glory to him as opposed to our, our rantings and complaining and things. You know, we, during the week we complain more than we praise God, right? And one thing that we complain about right now is tax. I know it. I know it because I'm feeling it. You're just, you're just relaxing there and you're looking at your paycheck and like, boop, boop. they took something out of it. <laughs> what you going to do? And you can't reverse it. You can't call Safaricom. <laughs> Can you reverse it, please? I did not intend to send this one. I don't want a house. I have my own. It's gone. You know, this is the other fact too. If things were working well, people wouldn't fail the pinch of the tax. If roads are paved everywhere, there are schools, there are hospitals, and all these things, if they were in place, people would not complain much about tax because their money is working. In fact, any politician would not campaign using the roads. We are so dumb that every time they come, they use the roads. Yet, it's our tax that is supposed to pay for that even without them campaigning. And you're like, yeah, he said he's going to build the roads. See your lives. <laughs> We're going to build what road? No, they're not going to do it. We know it. You know, these politicians who died a few years ago, be what? They would go around and asking him, hey, you say there's, there's tarmac in this place, in this place. And they're like, yeah, it's there. It has just been covered by dirt. <laughs> Man, we, we, we complain a lot. There's a lot of memory. There is less encouragement. Less, you know, I was, when we were having our devotion yesterday with the worship team, thinking about, you know, all the kids who have done well in the exam, right? You know, there, there is, there's a lot of celebrations on social media and schools and all that stuff. And those 
kids who got 180 like the car's speedometer. <laughs> They're feeling miserable right now. Who is going to encourage these kids? Who told you that they can't do something meaningful in life? Who is holding their hand and telling them, well, this didn't work. Life still continues and there are many other opportunities in life for you to grow and to do other things. We have a lot of tertiary courses and colleges and things that people can do. We're only celebrating the few who are at the top. What about the rest? We all need encouragement. And these kids, if you have them somewhere, if you know of them, please encourage them. They're right now feeling miserable. Because other kids have been, you know, they're lifted up and they're now taken to Rupert Mall for outings and, you know, all these things happening. Be kind to people. Be loving to people. Peter learned this so quickly through the Holy Spirit that whatever God has sanctified, you don't call unclean or common. But we see here after this, they magnified God. And Peter said, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just like us? You remember when he first preached, when 3,000 got born again, he said, the same spirit that has come upon us belongs to us and you too and your children. All you got to do is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He said, they have received the Holy Spirit just like us. And then he commanded, and you know the people he commanded? Those Jewish people. That he came with. They, they've been there. They've seen what is happening. So they're the ones who are going to baptize. And imagine baptizing people who you don't really like. The Lord has to break your heart and bre break this limitation and barriers for you to do that with the honest heart. And when they're doing this, maybe the Lord is walking in their heart, baptizing people and embracing them and telling them, welcome. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for making a good decision for your life. To follow Jesus is indeed the best decision you can ever make. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they requested him to stay a little longer. Why? For those who have received God's word joyfully, they always yearn for more. They always crave for more. They want it. They want it. They want to grow. And for sure he stayed a few more days to encourage them and to take them through the scriptures and to make them understand a few things. And the Lord was at work. I pray that the Lord will be at work in your life also. As the Lord blessed this men and women with the Holy Spirit. When they had the word, it doesn't matter what it is. God will still fill you with his Holy Spirit. It might be here. It might be at your house. Maybe you're driving. Maybe when today we're doing the baptism. You never know. You want to be baptized? You can join us in the third service. We'll baptize you. But the key is, do you believe in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ? He's not just a story that you have heard somewhere else. We have one maker. And we also have one savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe you're troubled for some reasons. Maybe there are other things that are not working. Just, we have many, many reasons. 
to just draw back and go our separate ways from the Lord. But the Lord is always gracious. The way, you know, he appeared, he came and saved Simon the sorcerer. Come into Cornelius. He will come. He came to Saul of Tarsus. Different situations. But God still brought them together. I don't know what your situation is. But all I know that the Lord is always at the door knocking. Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have an everlasting life. For those who have everlasting, those who would want to have the everlasting life, they wouldn't want to come out of the presence of God. So as we all pray, as we bow our heads in prayer, maybe you're there and you want some specific prayers. You need the Lord to walk in your heart. Right after this song, all the pastors will be here and our prayer team will be here ready to pray with you if you so desire. God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity you've given to us. We thank you that you're here with us. We thank you that you remain to be a faithful God. We have seen your word at work in the life of many people, uh, both the Jewish people, the Gentiles, and everyone. That same, same word that was powerful enough to change these people's life. It is the same word we have today. And we are asking that you would come today to our rescue. Every one of us, I know we need you. We need you. I pray that you will meet us today at the point of need. And as we give to you our offerings, Lord, we pray that we'll give that which will bring glory and honor to your name. You have blessed us, and this is a way for us to say thank you, God, for blessing our lives. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.